diversity of life. All right, looking at these two pictures, we got two squares here, A and B. Um, the question is, which one's more diverse? And in A, there is only one option. There's only blue stuff there. Um, in B, there is the circles as well as the, the blue space in there as well. So obviously, B is going to be more diverse. Um, between this one here, where we have A and B, which one's more diverse? Same idea. That there's only one type of circle on uh, option A, and option B has a number of different circles. So that's the one that's going to be more diverse. And then if we look at this particular setup here, comparing A and B again, we have a bunch of diverse circles. But in option B, we actually have a diversity of colors as well as shapes within the box. So that option is going to be more diverse. So today we're going to be talking about what diversity is and how that relates to what species are and how it interconnects with our ecosystems. So comparing, so looking at boxes, we can look at two different um, types of areas where you define living things. Um, so option B here, we have uh, looking at the uh, agricultural area. And option A, where we have a rainforest, we can see that all the same species are all planted in the same particular area in option B, probably because they're trying to grow some type of uh, produce or something like that, like maybe the old trees or something, um, but they're all the same. So it's a monoculture and it's very low in diversity. And then the square on the right here, labeled A, is what you'd see in, say, a uh, sort of swampy rainforest type of environment, where you have a number of different species all living together, and actually a huge variety of species all living together in one area. So in that case, the forest is going to be much, much more diverse. And when we talk about the diversity of living things, we use the word biodiversity, bio meaning living things, and having a variety of different living things is what biodiversity is all about. So when we talk about species, we've got a number of different ways of looking at it in biology. So we're going to go through some of those more common ways. And um, depending on sort of what, what field and what we want to concentrate on, we may use one definition or other, but there's one main one that we're going to be using. So the first one is called the morphological species concept. And morphological is referring to the, the shape of the organisms themselves. And so by looking at how it is structured, um, we can group things into different species. So organisms that appear anatomically, so their bodies seem similar, we would classify as them being the same species. So morphology is talking about the physical characteristics and using that to differentiate between one species and another. Sometimes this works really, really well. So here's, if you ever see those little woodlouse that live underneath wet wood, um, here's a relative of theirs, not the same species, but uh, a, a related species that actually lives in the ocean. Um, and they're actually quite big. If you compare that to, say, a dog, it is very easy to see the difference between those two. Uh, so morphological is an easy way to differentiate in that case. But um, if you look at this other example, there's two butterflies that if you saw one or the other, you may think they're both monikers, monarch butterflies. Um, but the viceroy is a type of butterfly that just ends up, happens to look similar to the monarch butterfly. So just basing it on the morphology of those two, it would be more difficult to tell those two species apart. If you're an entomologist, that's, that's what you make your living doing, so you'd be able to do it, but um, it can be more difficult depending on what type of organisms it is you're comparing. Then we have a, another definition of uh, what a species would be. It, it says organisms that can recognize each other as being potential mates equals the same species. So if they essentially interbreed with each other, then we can define them as the same species. So that works well. And so a hedgehog and rabbit may look kind of similar, but they do not interbreed. They do not see each other as being the same species. So they, they, they do not um, interbreed and produce offspring. But uh, it can also maybe not work particularly well. So a chihuahua and a great dane probably wouldn't be potential mates. However, they do happen to be the same species. So the, the recognition species concept works well in some cases, but not in others. So the, the main concept that we're going to go for in terms of what a species is as a definition is it's referred to as the biological species concept. And essentially it's saying that individuals within a population that are able to freely breed under natural condition, conditions and produce fertile offspring, those are the same species. So it's kind of related to that previous recognition species concept, um, but they have to be able to do it on their own and they have to be able to produce fertile offspring. Hybridization happens when you actually have 
um, two different species interbreeding, but it tends out not to happen very often. And the only reason why we can say that these two are different species is because they don't produce fertile offspring. So if their offspring are non-fertile, then they would have been a different species. So we're basing our definition of species on that they should be able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Just because they're not the same species doesn't mean they can't breed. And so there's a couple of examples of where you have closely related species able to breed. So a lion and a tiger are different species, but they are able to interbreed and you get something like a liger. A horse and donkey can interbreed to produce a mule. Polar bears and grizzly bears can interbreed and you get a roller bear, apparently is what it's called. Um, but if they are very closely related, they may be able to interbreed. But if a polar bear and a grizzly bear are by definition different species, then their offspring, the grower bear, would therefore be infertile. If their offspring was fertile, then we must have been dealing with the same species. If, if they're two different species, these hybrids would end up being infertile. All right, quick definition. Um, when we're talking about variation here, uh, physical separation and time can cause a change in a species. So we're gonna talk about this in, in more detail later on in the course. Um, but if you if you ever go to Hawaii, you might be able to see these types of geese that live there, and you'll probably recognize them as looking very similar to the geese that we have in Canada, um, called the Canadian goose, nicely enough. Um, but the Hawaiian goose here, I think it's called a nene or something like that, um, but it, it looks very similar. But essentially, we believe that they have come from a flock of Canadian geese that had been isolated from, or uh, geese very similar to Canadian geese, that had been isolated from the rest of the geese on the, um, in North America. And over a long period of time, when these geese that are now in Hawaii, when they arrived in Hawaii, they, they weren't able to interbreed back with the stock that is on the continent. And so whatever changes that population had would have slowly sort of been passed down to the next generation and that uh, colony that is in Hawaii would have ended up looking different than the other colony which have been living in North America the whole time. So we can end up with some variations that would have been within a species if those two populations are isolated for long enough those variations can actually end up with the change becoming significant enough that we get a new species. So if you were to take this Hawaiian goose and this Canadian goose, they, assuming they are actually different species, they would not be able to breed and produce fertile offspring. So this over long periods of time to a population, it's called evolutionary change. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about evolution. So biodiversity, putting a couple of things together, again, the, the diversity of life is the variety and the number of life forms in, in, given in a particular area that we're talking about. How much biodiversity is there on Earth? Um, a huge amount is the answer to that question. So um, named species, so if you look up on Wikipedia, all the different species of, of organisms out there, there's a huge amount of them. Um, so looking at the number of species of insects, we're talking lots and lots and lots. Um, there are fewer fungi ones, lots and lots of plants vertebrates there there's not a huge huge number of them but you could probably list off a couple of hundred from the top of your head um we know a lot of the vertebrates you can see sort of this bar graph here um of the ones that we know we pretty much give them all names people like to name big uh, animals like vertebrates but when it comes to something like insects we've named a huge number of them but there's still so many more that we have not actually named but in terms of variety if you look at these different groups of organisms when you think of animals, you probably think of a vertebrate. If I asked you to list 10 animals, you'd probably list off 10 vertebrates. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in terms of biodiversity, we have a huge amount of insects compared to however many things that have skeletons, the vertebrates that we actually have. Even you know, if you think of something like, like uh, uh, mollusks, there's a huge number of mollusks, a lot more mollusks than there are vertebrates on Earth. Um, but us being vertebrates, we tend to focus on things that are, are similar to us and familiar to us. But overall, there is a huge biodiversity. Um, and this is got fungi on here as well and plants, huge, huge number of biodiversity available. So the components of biodiversity, um, the biodiversity of the ecosystem is the, is the diversity of ecosystems within the biosphere. So the biosphere is the part of the earth that living things are able to survive in. So if you look at how many types of different species there are in there, that's looking at the, the diversity of those different ecosystems. 
So there are different types of ecosystems. We're not going to spend as much time talking about them as you did probably in other courses, but um, we know that based on the, the weather and, and the, the never, uh, different climate patterns, there can be different species that take over a particular area, um, and that can end up creating a particular ecosystem where you'd find a particular type of organisms that would be able to be successful in that area. So the organisms that are in a rainforest would be different than those in a prairie. Um, one of the main factors of that would be the amount of uh, light available and the amount of water available in those two different ecosystems. Then there's the diversity of habitats. So looking a little bit more detail, so within an ecosystem, you can have different habitats. So I think of this as structural diversity, um, the ranges of size and shapes and distributions of individuals within a particular ecosystem. And so if we look at uh, a comparison between two different ecosystems, so think of a tropical rainforest versus a, a, a monoculture of an agricultural field, so this particular tree plantation here, um, let's say they're growing cherries or something like that. Um, if we look at the artificial one, there's a lot less diversity of habitat. Essentially here you have the, the, the tree and you have the area under the tree and that's it. Uh, if you look at a more diverse ecosystem or with a more diverse habitat in it, there's going to be lots of different places where organisms are able to survive. So there's, there's uh, you could be up in the canopy of the tree or in the middle of the tree or in the understory of the tree. Um, a whole lot more variety and diversity of habitats within a natural ecosystem versus a artificial ecosystem. And then within that habitat, you can have species living there. And with a natural habitat in a natural ecosystem, there's probably going to be a very high diversity of species. So a large variety, a large number of different types of species. So think of this as being very rich in the number of species in that area. So if you look at somewhere like a coral reef, one of the, the very um, diverse areas in the a very diverse ecosystem in the world, there are many, 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 many different types of species. If you look at, say, a fish farm, there would just be one species that is only trying to grow one particular type of fish. So the diversity of species in an artificial ecosystem versus a natural ecosystem, um, the artificial one has a much less diversity of species. And finally, getting down to even more specifics, within a given species, so this is our species of humans here, uh, within a given species, there is also genetic variation within that species. And that's going to be really, really important for the success of that species. If a species does not have very much genetic diversity, it will not be able to survive adverse conditions very well. If it has lots of genetic diversity, there's a much better chance that it is able to survive as a species over a long period of time. And just quickly, last thing, diversity of interactions, uh, the different ways species interact. So the more species you have and the, the more um, structure you have in that particular ecosystem means there is going to be more diversity of interactions. So if you just have two species, there's really only one interaction that is possible. But if you have 12 species, there's going to be a, a huge exponential increase in the amount of ways that those species are able to interact with each other. So with a sort of increase in the diversity of the species, you have an exponential increase in the interactions between those species, a much more complex system. And fundamentally, um, the diversity of all of these systems that we're talking about is hugely important because by having that variety, uh, the diversity of the species, the diversity of the ecosystem, the diversity of the habitats, um, the more diversity that you have within those structures, the more able that ecosystem or even that species is able to survive adversity. If the conditions change and the system is diverse, it will be much more likely to survive. So should we be concerned about biodiversity? We have a big impact on our ecosystem in that we cause the extinction of many, many species directly by doing things like, like shooting white rhinos, um, but also indirectly by cutting down forests and, and taking over um, grasslands and planting fields. Um, all of that cuts down on the ecosystems that species rely on and therefore cuts down on the biodiversity of those areas. If you think of a, a forest, if we cut it down and plant a cornfield there, um, there's only going to be essentially one species. The, the goal of that farmer is to grow only corn. You don't want to have weeds growing in there or rodents living in there. You just want to have the corn. So the, the purpose of agriculture is to 
have one species survive over the others, which has a huge toll on biodiversity. There is a losing species at an alarming rate. Um, so some scientists have made that as many as three species per hour go extinct. So that's a huge, huge number. Remember, most of these species we don't know of yet. They haven't been identified yet. Um, but since we're, we're eliminating so much of their habitat, there are so many of these species going extinct so quickly. Um, when a species of plants and animals go extinct, others are going to be affected as well. So remember that diversity of interactions, if you pull one of those species away, all the other species that are interacting with it are also going to be affected by that. If we have biodiversity, there, there are many benefits to it. Um, so a huge number of species have been used for medicinal purposes, very selfishly, just for us in terms of being able to get prescription drugs um, and other uh, chemical compounds that we get from nature and we figure out how they work. Um, we get a lot of these from different species within our environment, or at least the idea of them from different species in our environment, and then we, we are able to develop on that idea. Um, some things like anti-cancer drugs are among those. Um, so that's really important for biodiversity, plus all of the benefits that those species offer to us. So uh, there's obviously uh, the, the idea of uh, being able to capture carbon out of the atmosphere and being able to produce oxygen, really, really important. Uh, we don't know all of the benefits that this, bio, this uh, diversity of species allows for us uh, until they are gone. Whenever we've tried to have a limited number of species in a closed system, like the biodome experiment tried to do, we find that things don't work out as well as we want them to because we don't appreciate all of the interactions that are needed to keep a system running. So biodiversity, hugely important in terms of keeping any biological system stable and allowing it to overcome any sort of changes or stresses um, adversely to those systems.